Hare Krishna, Domi. So, Maharaj, we're just waiting for a few people who are having some trouble with their connection. Oh. Here's somebody now. Some internet connectivity problems. It's most... So, a few local people are having issues, actually, logging on. Oh, okay. So if, if you wouldn't mind just bear, bearing with us for maybe five more minutes. Oh, okay. While I've got you here, Maharaj, tomorrow morning, um, I won't be present at the beginning of the class for maybe 40 minutes because I have to take a call from um, another country because of the time zones. I'm going to be in a meeting for a while. Um, so Krishna Vijay Prabhu, Krishna Vijay Prabhu, are you here? Yes, Prabhu, I'm here. Can you just switch your video on so Maharaj knows what you look like? Yeah, I, I remember him. You remember him, yeah? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, so could, I wouldn't pick him out in a crowd, but I did meet him before. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, ju I'm just going to spotlight him um, for you. Um, can you see him? He's waving. Oh, maybe you can't. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So... Krishna Vijay Prabhu will be here to, to assist um, for some of the sessions as well. Um, so we should be all right um, with things that you need during the class. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I think you can probably begin now. We've got um, 23 people so far. Okay, we'll begin. Uh... Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Shaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschachya Deshatarine Panchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our uh, Bhakti Shastri ongoing study. We are now on beginning chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita. So this is the final section of the Bhagavad Gita study. You've already uh, had two sessions, the first six chapters being the first session of Bhagavad Gita, and then you've just finished chapter 7 to 12, I think, right? You just finished that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you're the survivors. <laughs> Some people have not been able to keep up the course. You know, it's like that. I remember when I went to college, you know, when I went into college, they told us, you know, there's a person on your left and there's a person on your right. When you finish, there'll only be one of you. <laughs> One third of the people take it, who enrolled in the first year, one third will graduate. And so it was like that. And it's a bit like this here with Bhakti Shastri. Not that we're uh, failing people, but it's just difficult for people to get the time 
to keep up with the different assignments and listen to the classes. It becomes difficult. So well done. Congratulations to all of you for hanging in there. So we're on this uh, chapter 13. It's an interesting chapter. Nature, the enjoyer and consciousness, Srila Prabhupada calls it. Uh, the Sanskrit term for this chapter is Shetra Shrechagna. Shetra Shetragna Vibhaga Yoga. So we're going to hear about the Shetra and the Shetragna today. Hmm. So let's first of all this uh, final section of the Bhagavad Gita is uh, dealing with knowledge, jnana and how by jnana we can come to bhakti. Just like in the first six, six chapters, the first six chapters was more putting attention into karma. And by karma, by activities, we could come to bhakti. In the middle six chapters, we heard about bhakti itself. And we heard about mixed devotion and pure devotion, ananya bhakti. So now in this final portion, we're going to hear about the process of knowledge. And Krishna will be speaking a lot about the modes of nature. We'll see this coming up again and again, the influence of the modes of nature and how we need to come to the mode of goodness and try to fix ourselves in the mode of goodness, and from the mode of goodness we can transcend to pure goodness. So some people, they think that the goal of the Bhagavad Gita will be taught at the end of the Bhagavad Gita. But Srila Prabhupada explains that it's not quite like that. And he, give, he gives the example of a sandwich. He said, you get the good thing in the middle. You know, you get, I don't know about so much in India, but at least in the West, we, we're fond of eating sandwiches. And we eat bread, you know, and they, they put something in the middle. They'll put the cheese or the, the, the burger or the veggie burger, of course. And uh, the salad, it all goes in the middle. And on the outside you have the bread. And so Bhagavad Gita is a bit like that. The first six chapters and the last six chapters, they're like the covering of bhakti, which is there in the middle, the very heart of the Bhagavad Gita. We see chapter 9, the most confidential knowledge. So that was the heart of the Bhagavad Gita. So this final section, this is the the covering, one of the coverings of the Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada said, uh, it's not that the good thing is at the end. It's not that knowledge is a goal, but bhakti is a goal. And that message came out again and again. All right, then the connection between chapter 12 to chapter 13. We should know. Uh, in chapter 12, verse number 7, Lord Krishna had described how he is the swift deliverer for all of those devotees who take shelter of him, that he delivers them from the ocean of birth and death. And Srila Prabhupada highlights that in his purport. He explains how... Is everyone hearing me okay? Yes, okay. So, so long as I'm not muted or anything. It is okay. Okay. So just to introduce to you uh, the connection here, chapter 12 to chapter 13, that uh, chapter 12, Krishna says, I deliver the devotee from the ocean of birth and death. So Prabhupada explains 
very emphatically that Krishna is the one, or the Supreme Lord, he comes riding on the back of Garuda and he picks up the conditioned soul from the material world and takes him back to Godhead. Krishna promises like that, that, that he, he delivers his devotee out from this ocean of material existence. Prabhupada gives a nice example. He said, just like one may be in the middle of the ocean, but even if you're a strong swimmer, you, never, you could never swim across the ocean. One of the things they tell you, you know, if, you're in the, if you do happen to be in that unfortunate position that you're in the middle of the ocean, maybe a plane crashes and you find yourself in the middle of the ocean or a, the boat goes down, somehow you're adrift there in the ocean, they tell you don't try to swim because you'll never reach. It's so far away, you can never get to the shore. You just have to wait for somebody to come and get you. So, in devotional service, it's also like that. The ocean of material existence, it's not our struggle, it's not by our struggle that we get out of that ocean of material existence, but it's Krishna who comes and mercifully <coughs> Excuse me. Krishna comes and mercifully picks us up and brings us on the back of Garuda and takes us back to Godhead. So, how do we qualify for that? This is going to be described in this final section of the Bhagavad Gita, in particular the 13th chapter. We're going to hear the knowledge, the, the sort of mood which we have to cultivate in order to attract the Lord there, to come and deliver us from the ocean of material existence. Alright, so that's a little introduction to the topic. So chapter 13, let's begin. We can all chant the verses together. The first, there are two verses for the first one and two. Arjuna's question and then Krishna's answer. So we can chant together. Arjuna uvacha prakritim purusham chaiva shetram shetrakyam evacha etat viditam ichami jnanam giyam chakeshava Shri Bhagavan uvacha Idam shariram konte a Shetram iti adabiyate Etat yo veti tam prahu Shetragya iti tadpada So Arjuna's question. Arjuna said, O oh my dear Krishna, I wish to know about Prakriti nature, Purusha, the enjoyer, and the field, and the knower of the field, and of knowledge, and the object of knowledge. So Arjuna is asking these questions. He wants to know about these six items. We'll, we're of course expected to become familiar with these Sanskrit terms, and not very difficult for you Indian-bodied persons, very familiar with Prakriti and Purush, Right? Purusha, of course, here doesn't just simply mean man, but it means the enjoyer. Right? The enjoyer. So, Prakriti and Purusha. Arjuna wants to know about these two things, Prakriti and Purush. These are, it's not easy, not an easy subject to discuss. Therefore, we'll see that when Krishna replies, Krishna doesn't begin with the Prakriti and the Purush, because that's a more complicated thing. Just like if somebody gives you some questions, you'll take the easy questions first, usually. And the more complicated questions, leave it for the, uh, later. So Prakriti and Purush, it's a more complex. So Krishna takes the easier questions first. So. Prakriti, Purush, and then the field and the knower of the field. The field being Shetra and 
the knower of the field, Shitragna. Right? The knower of the field. So, then Arjuna also wants to know about knowledge and the object of knowledge. Knowledge, jnanam, and the ob object of knowledge, geyam. Sorry if my pronunciation is off. <laughs> I'm Western, I'm not, my Sanskrit pronunciation is always lacking. Please forgive me. Sorry about that, but I'm sure you can understand. Anyway, jnanam, knowledge, and gyayam, the object of knowledge. Arjuna wants to know these six questions. This is the six questions. So Krishna begins talking, first of all, about the shitra and the shitragna, the field and the knower of the field. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, this body, O son of Kunti, is called the field, and one who knows this body is called the knower of the field. Right? The field, the body. Quite nice example, nice way to describe the, the body. It's a field. Just like the farmer has a field. Maybe you possess some land. You know, sometimes in different countries, like in Russia, they give each Russian person a piece of land. Because, it, you know, it was initially, it was, before it was a socialist country, so they, uh, maybe it's still socialist, but before it was communist, but they, they have that principle that everything belongs to the state. So they divide the land up and they give everyone a piece of land. And the people can go off to the land and they can grow their vegetables if they want. And many people do it. It's, it's especially when, once they're retired, they're not working in the factory or anything anymore. So they can go on the land and they just grow some vegetables and they can, in the summer at least, they can go grow things and they put them by and in the winter time they can use them up. So our body is like a field. We plant the, the seeds there. We're using it to cultivate. We're performing activities and we harvest the results according to the seeds we plant according to the manner in which we work, we will have different results. In China, they have a saying that if you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, you will harvest beans. You cannot expect to plant melons and harvest beans. Right? So, it's like that. If we do good, then we will get good results. And if we work in a bad way, then we bring trouble on ourselves. So the body is a field, it's a field. According to how we use the field, we get different results. The body produces the different fruits or results, the seeds, uh, the, the crops, the harvest seen in the body. And then the knower of the body. One who knows this body is called the knower of the field, the Shetrakna. Shetrakna, the knower of the field. So Prabhupada gives some examples about knowing how we can know the field. He says that, he, Prabhupada, let's read from Prabhupada's purport here, how Prabhupada explains it very nicely. He said, uh, well, first of all, reading from the first paragraph in the purport here, right? Uh, do you all have the text before you, or do you want me to share the screen? We have one. We have the text. Everybody has the text. Good. Okay. So, on the purport, the first paragraph there, uh, Prabhupada writes, uh, the field of activity is the body. And what is the body? The body is made of senses. 
the conditioned soul wants to enjoy sense gratification. And according to his capacity to enjoy sense gratification, he is offered a body or field of activities. Therefore, the body is called Kshetra or the field of activity for the conditioned soul. Now, the person who should not identify himself with the body is called Kshetragya, the knower of the field. It is not very difficult to understand the difference between the field and its knower, the body and the knower of the body. Not very difficult for Prabhupada, it may be difficult for a lot of materialistic people who are very strongly in the bodily concept of life, but for most of us it's not a difficult thing to understand that there's a knower in the body. Sometimes Prabhupada will say this thing, not very difficult, just like he said, four regulated principles, he said, not very difficult, but, you know, for many people it's very difficult. Uh, anyway, Prabhupada then continues, any person can, can consider that from childhood to old age he undergoes so many changes of body and yet is still one person remaining. Thus there is a difference between the knower of the field of activities and the actual field of activities. A living conditioned soul can thus understand that he is different from the body. It is described in the beginning, Dehino Smin, the living entities within the body, the body is changing boyhood, from childhood to boyhood, from boyhood to youth, from youth to old age, and the person who owns the body knows that the body is changing. Right? What are some examples which Prabhupada gives to help us understand the difference between the body and the soul? We will ask the you devotees, maybe uh, you can raise your hands. Hare Krishna. Karana oh. Sindhu Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Yeah, body is temporary in nature and soul is eternal. Can you give some an example? What kind of examples did Prabhupada give to help us to understand the difference between the body and the soul? Maybe Radha Vrindavan Chandra Prabhu? Like a, like a car and its driver, so the car does not move unless the driver is in there. The car is like a body and the driver is like a soul. Okay, good. Yes? Dr. Leela Mataji? Hare Krishna, Prabhupada often said that uh, we say this is my hand, this is my leg, my feet, but then who am I? Yes, that, uh, very good, yes, it's a good example. Uh -huh. Any others? There are many. You know, sometimes you may have to go to school, when Prabhu, Prabhupada would sometimes go to children's school, you know, and. When we go to children's school, then we show us how to preach to all these people, to the children. He would have a young boy come out from the audience, he would ask first of all, who is the top student, who is the most intelligent student? And so they would, you know, they'd point to some boy and the young boy would come up and then Prabhupada would ask him, so where is your hand, where is your head, where is your foot and where are you? Right? And this way, in this way Prabhupada was teaching them about the soul. Uh, we have Rajamita Prabhu who want to ask something. Uh, 
Hare Krishna Maharaj, except my one question. Uh, Prabhupada gave the analogy of uh, the sky, sky reflected in the water reflection, represents both the sun and the moon, and the stars also. So, I'm sorry, Prabhu, what's this example? The Prabhupada gave the analogy of the of the sky, the stars and the moon, and uh, it's representing the compared to the living entities and the moon and the supreme lord, the uh, super soul in the body, the difference between the body and the soul. Um, we have few more hands raised. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd like to hear. Yeah, Smriti Karuna Matri. Hare Krishna Maharaj, welcome all. Maharaj Shri Prabhupada often told about the near death experience and out of body experience. So there he tells the example of how there is a difference between body and the soul. How does it, what, what's the example? He'll tell about the incarnations and how the, the near death experiences that people, you know, they see themselves uh, when they're out of the body. And that is how he explains that, uh, that we are not the body, we are the soul. Oh, okay. Near death experiences. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, all right. Amiya Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, then we pronounce. Uh, we have heard the example of accepting new garments, just like we accept material bodies. Yes, new garments. Okay, good. Sarveshwar uh, Shamsundar Prabhu. Yes. Mr. Manaj, uh, I think Prabhupada gave the idea of saving the drowning person instead of uh, saving the shirt instead of saving the drowning person. Oh, yes, the drowning person, right. What happens? What happens? Do you remember? What happens? The person's drowning, so what happens? The man comes to try, try to save him, and what, what does he do? So, yeah, he's saving the shirt, but not his body, actually. Right. He brings the, he brings the man's shirt, but not the body. He, he thinks, if, he says, I've saved him, I've saved him, and he holds up the shirt, right. So this, these are all different examples which we, we could give to explain the difference between the body and the soul. Okay. Um, Maharaj, we have few more devotees raise their hands. Do oh. you want to hear from them? Yeah, okay. How uh, many? Harishuri, Madhavi, Madhavi. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So Prabhupada gives this example that if somebody dies, then everybody says that he is gone. So Prabhupada says that the body is here, so where is he gone? Oh, very good. Yes, thank you. Mm, nice to hear. Yes? And yes? Who is it? Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance. Maharaj Srila Prabhupada also spoke about uh, the chariot model, the five horses, and the parrot and the cage example. That how the soul is like a parrot in the cage. Okay. Yes, the soul is the soul is which where on the chariot? Uh, the soul is the passenger. The soul is the, pa the five horses are the senses. Right. And the rain, uh, the driver is the intelligence and the reins is the mind. Oh very good. Okay. Yes, right. So so many nice examples are there. We've had this before, this is nothing new. Not, but this is, this is just the introduction to the topic. The second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is called Sankhya Yoga. And so this, is a, this, this section here in the 13th chapter, this is another continuation of the Sankhya, which was presented in the second chapter. We're going to get an, an elaboration, more details of the Sankhya, which was 
presented very briefly in the second chapter. So we learn that there's the body, the field, and then there's the knower of the field, the soul. Within the body there's another. Right? So then reading again from Prabhupada's purport, he says, uh, the owner is distinctly Shetratna. Sometimes we think, I am happy, I am a man, I am a woman, I am a dog, I am a cat. These are the bodily designations of the knower. But the knower is different from the body. Although we may use many articles, clothes, etc., we know that we are different from the things used. Similarly, we can also understand by a little contemplation that we are different from the body. All right, so this way Prabhupada is explaining the knower of the field, the Shetragna, within the body, there's another. Uh, we'll just read this, the, the next paragraph there where Prabhupada talks about the, the Bhagavad Gita. Someone may like to read for us, Krishna Vijay Prabhu, could you read in the first six chapters? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, the Said, yes. In the first six in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita. Last paragraph, Prabhu. <coughs> it starts with that sentence. Um, I I Maybe someone else could read then. Mariji, you can read. Maharaj. Can I, can I read? Okay. In the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the knower of the body, the living entity, and the position of which we can understand the Supreme Lord are described. In the middle six chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the relationship between the individual soul and super soul is regard to devotional, ser devotional service are described. The superior position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the subordinate position of the individual soul are definitely defined in these chapters. The living entities are subordinate under all circumstances, but in their forgetful, they are suffering. When enlightened by pious activities, they approach the Supreme Lord in different capacities. As the distressed, those in want of money, the inquisitive, and those in search of knowledge, they and that is also described. Now, starting with the 13th chapter, how the living entity come into contact with the material nature and how he is delivered by the Supreme Lord through the different methods of fruitive activities, cultivation of knowledge, and the discharge of devotional service are explained. Although the living entity is completely different from the material body, he somehow becomes related. This is also his explained. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, thank you. So Prabhupada talks here about how the living entities, in, they approach the Lord in different capacities. Did you recognize the particular sloka from Bhagavad Gita which Prabhupada is referring? All right? Yeah. Um, yes? Yes. So uh, this is like Chaturvida Bhajante Ma. Yes. Right? Yes, right. That's right. Yeah. Right. They're all pious people, right? They're all enlightened by pious activities. Some are in distress, some are in want of money, some are inquisitive, and some are in search of knowledge. But they've come to Krishna. And why did they come? Because they have some sukriti, they have some pious activities to their credit. Somehow they contacted the devotees and they were receptive and that has brought them to Krishna. So 
this chapter we're going to hear how the living entities come in contact with the material nature and how Krishna delivers them through karma or jnana or bhakti. So this will all be described to us in this 13th chapter. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, we'll go ahead if there are no questions. Let's go on into text number three. We can chant the Sanskrit together. Shetra jam chapi mam vidhi Sarva shetri shubharata Shetra shetra knayo gyanam Tadjad gyanam matam mama Right, someone like to read the translation? Yes. O oh, scion of Bharata, you should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies. And to understand this body and its knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. Mm. So, this is a very uh, interesting verse. And the, the Mayavadis, they're very fond of this verse. Can you under, could, could any, would anyone like to take up why uh, the Mayavadis are so fond of this verse? Can you see the, the, the implications? Any volunteers? Yes. Hey Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. This Maharaj, because uh, they, this sloka says, I am also knower of this body. So they may think that uh, soul and the super soul are at the same level. I'm right, saying. that's the point. Yes, that's what they think. Shankara, Shankaracharya said that I am the one, <laughs> it is I who reside in all bodies. <laughs> And, you know, that I, he's saying, I am you, you are me. It's something <laughs> I remember before becoming a devotee, there was a, a song, famous song by the Beatles, you know, the music group, the Beatles. They had associated with a big impersonalist, the Maharishi, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. So he's actually from Shankaracharya, big impersonalist, and he popularized TM, Transcendental Meditation. And so they had a song, the Beatles had written a song that I am you and you are me and we are all one together. So, be careful if there are people in the background, if, you, if there's people in the background, you may have to mute yourself. So they had popularized that kind of impersonal mood, that it's all one, that we're all one. I am you, and you are me, and we're all God, and we can do anything we like. So this verse, it, it, it lends itself to that kind of interpretation. Krishna is saying, I am the knower in all bodies. And so, People take it, they're thinking, well, I'm also Krishna, I know my body, I'm not, why can't I know other bodies? Uh, we know all bodies. I don't just, they're thinking like that. They're thinking that they know all bodies. But, of course, we, we do not know other bodies. We only know our own body. We know our own pleasures and pains. We don't know the pains and pleasures of others. We only have the experience of our own bodily pains and successes. But it's not possible for us to fully appreciate what others experience. So our consciousness is limited to our body. We don't know about other people's consciousness. So 
this is the point. So in this verse, Lord Krishna, let's read the translation. O Sayana Bharata, you should understand, I am also the knower in all bodies, and to understand this body and its knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. So Krishna has defined what is knowledge, right? What is knowledge as defined here? Knowledge means that we should know both the body and its knower. And we will learn, of course, that there are two knowers within the body, not just one knower. So we have to know the body and the knower within the body, meaning both the soul and the super-soul. That is actual knowledge. So this is Krishna's definition of knowledge. So Prabhupada gives very nice example in this verse to help us to understand the difference between the super-soul and the individual soul. Maybe we can have someone read here. Uh, beginning, the Lord says, I am the knower of the field of activities. Can we have a volunteer? The Lord says, I am the knower of the field of activities in every individual body. The individual may be the knower of his own body, but he is not in knowledge of other bodies. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is present as the Super Soul in all bodies, knows everything about all bodies. He knows all different bodies of all the various species of life. A citizen may know everything about his patch of land, but the king knows not only his palace, but all the properties possessed by the individual citizens. Similarly, one may be the proprietor of the body individually, but the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of all bodies. The king is the original proprietor of the kingdom, and the citizen is the secondary proprietor. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the Supreme Proprietor of all bodies. Oh, thank you. Yes. So this is a very powerful example Srila Prabhupada is giving for help, to help us to understand the difference between the Lord, who is within the heart of all living entities, and the individual living entity. Hmm. It's a very appropriate example. You know, you may be living, renting an apartment. Like here in Mayapur, many people, they're living somewhere in like Abhay Nagar or Gaur Nagar, and they're renting. And the person they're renting from, he has several apartments, and he takes money from each of them. So he's, he's the apartment owner, and he knows about all of his apartments. And we only know about the one apartment which we're renting. So this body is like our apartment or like our land in the, in the kingdom of the king. The king knows all the land. We just have our own piece of land. We take care of our own land. But the king knows about all the land. Alright, so the point is, there's not simply one soul, but there are two souls within the body. And that fact is supported later on in the 15th chapter. We will see how Lord Krishna gives more clear indication of the presence of the super soul. Of course, it's, it's a controversial point, And we know that many people, they will interpret the Shastra, Bhagavad Gita, they will interpret it as being uh, Advaita philosophy. They will say, it's all one, ultimately the Supreme is one, and they will have many quotes and references to support this. 
But we see in the 15th chapter, Krishna gives more clear indication of the presence of the super soul. So this is something which go always goes on. I remember one time uh, there was a journal in India, it was called Bhavan's Journal, and the reporter came to meet Srila Prabhupada and he had prepared a number of very nice questions. I think that the, the answers which Prabhupada gave, they're all recorded and they're in one of Prabhupada's books, maybe in Science of Self-Realization. But anyway, one of the questions was that here in India we have two philosophies. We have Dvaita and Advaita. Advaita meaning oneness and Dvaita meaning dualism. In other words, some people say there's only the one soul and other people say, no, there are two. So who's right? <laughs> so Prabhupada said to the reporter, he said, they're both right. He said, let them both chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so Prabhupada didn't want to spend a lot of time arguing on this point. But uh, of course it is a quite a a big topic and there are many examples and we will see how Lord Krishna himself deals with it. In verse number 5, Lord Krishna shows us how to tackle this problem. Alright, we'll go ahead. The body cons consists of the senses and the Supreme Lord is Rishikesh, the controller of the senses. He is the original controller, just as the king is the original controller. The Lord says, I am also the knower. That means he is the super knower. The individual soul knows only his particular body. All right. Uh, Prabhupada makes the point, the distinction between the field of activities, the knower of activities and the supreme knower of activities is described as follows. And then Prabhupada talks, what is knowledge? Perfect knowledge of the constitution of the body, constitution of the individual soul and constitution of the super soul is known in terms of Vedic literature as Gyan. That is the opinion of Krishna. So this is actual knowledge. We want to understand the difference. Purusha, the enjoyer of nature, described here. Not yet discussed, but will be, will be discussing. It will be brought up. Uh, Prabhupada says, he gives an example here. He said, one, should, one has to understand the position of Prakriti, nature, Purusha, the enjoyer of nature, and Ishwara, the knower who dominates or controls nature and the individual soul. One should not confuse the three in their different capacities. One should not confuse the painter, the painting, and the easel, right? <laughs> the painter, the painting, and the easel. So, would anyone like to tell us who, who is the, first of all, who, what does the easel represent? Does the easel represent the Lord or the individual soul or material nature? Do we have some hands? Um, not yet, Master. Does everyone understand the question? Only one. No, we want everyone to give an answer. Everyone, you have to pick. This, the easel, you know what the easel is? It's a stand which the painting is on. So does the easel represent the Purusha, the Supreme Lord, the Ishwara, or Prakriti, right? There's Prakriti, Purusha, and Ishwara. So, which one is which one is the easel? Lila Madhuri Mataji. 
How many people say, let's have hands, you have to, you have to respond. How many people say, the ESO represents Prakriti? How many hands do we have? I also say. Yes, ESO is Prakriti. Uh, does anybody, how many people say the ESO represents the Purusha? And how many people say the ESO represents Ishwara? Anybody? You got four hands raised. For Ishwara? Yeah. Sorry, two for Ishwara. Nope, now it's gone down to one. And now they've gone. <laughs> <laughs> you, had, you had 13 for the Prakriti, and then you had um, six for the Purusha, and then um, now they all, all disappeared. Okay, okay. I hope they all disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now what, what about the painting? Is the painting going to be the Prakriti, the Purusha or the Ishwara? How many people say the painting is Prakriti? One, three, four, five, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Wow. Nine, nine people. And how many people say that the, the painting is the Purusha? And how many people say painting is Ishwara? One, two, two people. Okay. It's confusing this one, isn't it? Yeah. And what about the painter? Is the painter Prakriti? How many for Prakriti? Okay, anybody for Purusha? We have an eight, ten, ten, yeah, eleven. And anybody for Ishwara? Ishwara. Ten, eleven, twelve. Ten. Eleven. <laughs> twelve. <laughs> okay. Eleven, eleven it's settled on eleven. All right, good. Oh, yeah. twelve. <laughs> it's an interesting they, they would often give this question in the test you know <laughs> when, 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 I, when I left you on Friday I left with this question in my head because this is we spent some time talking about this on Friday Maharaj and I and I, I must admit I went in quite that order <laughs> he knows it's my favourite chapter not to teach this one <laughs> And Prabhupada actually doesn't say which one is which, but he just says, he just said, don't confuse the painter, the painting, and the easel. Okay, <laughs> okay, we won't confuse the painter, the painting, and the easel. But to compare which one is the Prakriti, and the, I think generally we would say that the easel represents the Prakriti, the mat everything resting on the material nature, and the paint. The painter is the supreme lord; that he's the he's the ultimate controller. He dominates everything, controlling everything, and the painting is the purusha. Generally, we would explain like that. Anyway, the main point is we have to be able to distinguish between the three, which one is nature, which one is the Supreme Lord, and which one is the living entity. And then, at the end of this paragraph, then Prabhupada says, <laughs> he said, there are three Brahman conceptions. Prakriti is Brahman, as the field of activities. And the jiva, the individual soul, is also Brahman and is trying to control material nature. And the controller of both of them is also Brahman. He is the factual controller. <laughs> so this, this is uh, 
I, again, you can see it's similar to Mayavadi philosophy a little bit. Mayavadi say would love this quote. Shankaracharya, he always said, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. Everything is Brahman. Everything comes from Brahman. So <laughs> that's why they say, you know, it's all one. They say, I am you, you are me, we're all God. It's all one. There, there's a oneness, but there is also the difference, right? And we have to emphasize that point. That while there is a oneness, the spiritual nature of everything is there. The fact that it's the energy of the Lord makes it Brahman. But there is also a difference. Lord Chaitanya was eating dirt. His mother wasn't happy. <laughs> Remember that pastime, Lord Chaitanya, was, he, 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 or was it Krishna had been eating? Well, of course, Krishna was also eating dirt. But, but the, similarly, Lord Chaitanya, he had some clay pots and he was eating the clay. His mother was very shocked. And Lord Chaitanya said, why? He said, you give me, you give, everything you give me, it's a transformation of the earth. It comes from the earth. You give me the food, it's a transformation from the earth. What's wrong with me eating earth? Why I should not eat the mud? And Mother said she defeated him. She said, no, listen, it's not like that. When we have mud, and if it's just a lump of mud, you cannot keep any water. But when the mud is made into a pot, we can store water in the pot and keep it. So there's a difference. And when you eat food, the food which I give you will nourish your body and give you strength. But if you simply eat the dirt and eat the mud, that will give you disease. It's not going to nourish your body. So you can understand the difference from the effect. Okay. So, Prabhupada continues, next paragraph, in this chapter, someone please read. In this chapter, it will also be explained that out of the two numbers, one is fallible and the other one is infallible. One is superior and the other one is subordinate. One who understands the two knowers of the field to be one and the same contradicts the technology of Godhead, who states, who states here very clearly, I am also the knower of the field. One who misunderstands a rope to be a serpent is not in knowledge. There are different kinds of body and there are different owners of the body. All right. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Thank you. Yes. So this is the, the, the point here, that there are two knowers in the body. There's the soul and the super soul. And we will, we're going to be hearing about this in more verses. All right. We'll go ahead. Text number four. Let's chant the verse. Tachitram yachcha yagrutcha. Yad vikari yatascha yat sacha yo yat prabhavascha tat samasena me shrinu. Yes, someone please read translation. Now please hear my brief description of this field or of activity and how it is constituted, what its things are, when it is produced, who the knower of the field of activities is, and what his influence are. So Lord Krishna is summarizing what he's going to talk about here in this chapter. He's going to explain to us, first of all, there will be a description of the field of activities and how it's constituted. And then we'll hear also about what the changes of the field of activity are and how it's produced. And then at the second half of the chapter, 
we'll hear about the knower of the field of activities and what his influences are. So this will all be explained in the course of the chapter. We'll go ahead. Text number five, an important verse. We'll chant together. Rishi bir bahuda gitam chando bir vividai pritak brahma sutra padais chaiva etumad bir vinas chitai. Translation? Someone read? The knowledge of the feet of activities and of the knower of the activities is described by the various sages in the various Vedic written writings. It's especially presented in Vedanta Sutra with all the reasonings as to the cause and effect. All right. Knowledge of the field of activities. What's the Sanskrit term we use for that? Yes, right. No, well, that's the knower of the field of activity. But the field of activities is the Kshetra and knowledge of the field. So knowledge of the Kshetra and the knower of activities. The knower of activities is? Kshetragna. right. So, so Krishna wants to establish, is it... Is it simply one soul or two souls? So Krishna is saying, this knowledge you, we, we, is described by various sages, right? Various sages in various Vedic writings. And then he particularly talks about the Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra as it's also called. So generally in our Krishna conscious philosophy, we say we have three authorities, right? Who are our, what are our three authorities? Parallel tracks. The three authorities? Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. Thank you, Prabhu, yes. So, in this verse, who is Guru? Where is the Guru here? Huh? Guru Sadhu Shastra. Who's the Guru? Krishna. Krishna, yes, Krishna. Remember, Arjuna had surrendered to Krishna. Shishasti ham sadhi mam tvam prapanam. Krishna's the Guru. So, Krishna's the Guru. And then he says also, it's just this knowledge is described by various sages, right? They're described here, various sages. Uh, and Chandobi Vividai Pritak, Vedic hymns, various Vedic hymns. Oh, why? Rishibi, Rishibi, by the wise sages, the very first word. Rishibi at Bahudagitam, the sages. So, we look to them for, uh, for guidance. And then we look to the Shastra also, the Chandubi, Chandubi, the Vedic hymns, and the Brahma Sutra, the essence of the Vedas from Vyasadev. So, this way, Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru, Lord Krishna, is also there to guide us. So it's important for us, and sometimes we will spend some time uh, to do a little exercise to consider what happens if we just have Guru and we don't have Sadhu and Shastra. Anybody would like to suggest what, what would be the result of such a situation? You simply follow Guru. Somebody said, I have blind faith in my Guru. Oh, I don't know about Shastra. I don't know what all these sages say. I just follow my Guru. Is that a healthy situation? Hindu Lekha 
no if we do not follow the shastra and only follow guru it is not good because like uh, uh, we may have a misleading because uh, uh, if guru is not quoting from shastra if he is not giving the knowledge from shastra that knowledge is not authentic it may not be authentic right if you don't know what's in the shastra and you just believe everything your guru tells you but that can be a very dangerous situation. And we have had a lot of problems, different cults and so on. You know, society often very worried that uh, going to gurus and surrendering your life to a guru and you don't know quite the qualification of the guru. So we don't just only surrender to guru. But we have to also see that the Guru is following Shastra and that he is also in, in harmony with other great sages and recognized by other spiritual authorities. It's important. Now somebody may say, well, I don't, I don't trust Gurus, I'm just going to follow Shastra. I will just have Shastra. Is that also a good situation? Would someone like to say what may happen then if we just try to follow Shastra? Sachinandan Prabhu, you want to answer? Yeah, uh, Maharaj, uh, in that case one may not be able to reach to the correct understanding. Uh, one may not be able to check his understanding whether he's right or wrong. And what? how to practically apply it also. Why? Because he won't have anyone to check it with. He won't have any authority to check his understanding in the practical application. You mean, but he's reading Shastra? He's reading it, but he's understanding it through his mind and intelligence. He's right. He, he, he may, be, may be speculating. He may just simply be understanding it through his own limited mind and intelligence, as you say, right? So he, he doesn't know the real message of the Shastra. And the Shastras also say that you have to have a guru and you have to follow the sages. The Shastras also tell us it's important that we should have a guru, we should follow the great sages. And so you say you follow Shastra, but you don't have guru, you don't follow sages, something's wrong. Not very good situation, not a healthy situation. Mm -hmm. And then somebody else, they just follow sadhus. They don't have guru and they don't have any shastra. So, what is the result? What will happen? Hare Shri Mahadevi Mukti. Hare Krishna. So actually that is also not a very handy situation because we don't know the, the sages, they might not be referring, they might be doing on their own mental speculation, especially the gyanis and all. So they mostly believe on their mental speculation. So we won't know the correct, we won't have correct understanding of what the actual truth is. Yes, yes, definitely. So it's very important for us that we need all three authorities there. We need to have sadhu, shastra and guru. It's a, an important point and Lord Krishna is showing it for our, for our benefit that Lord Krishna himself, although he's the Supreme Lord and Lord Krishna has already declared in the seventh chapter, he said, there is no truth superior to me. Everything rests on me just like pearls are strung on a thread. But Lord Krishna himself is referring to Vedanta Sutra and he's talking also about the opinions of the great sages. So Lord Krishna himself is making this important point to us. Is this okay? Any questions? We have a question, I think, from Sachinandan Prabhu. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, in the no. Purport to 13, uh, this third verse of the chapter, 
that it has its origin from the Brahman. The spiritual nature itself manifests the material nature. So in this way the Prakriti is also considered to be one conception of the Brahman. But I mean, it, uh, if we look at it in that sense, uh, like a child is originated from parents, but the child is different from the parent. He cannot be said that he's, he's the same as the parent. No, but he represents your family. He represents your family. Not separate from, it, from the family. You can't say separate from the parents. The child is certainly part of your family. So, uh, Prakriti being manifested from Brahm, therefore it is from Brahm. I mean, but it is, simultaneously it is different from spirit, it's matter. Yes, it's temporary. Yes, we would say that. But in some ways it, it's, t it's matter, but in, when we, if you consider it in the sense of its origin, where it comes from, in that sense you can say it's also Brahman. So this is the, the way, it's, this is how it's being described like this here. It's, uh, and, uh, one more thing, Maharaj, if uh, I, I just couldn't join timely and my life was having some problem. I was wondering where, how this Arjuna uh, comes to asking these questions about property and all. I mean, I was not able to find the link. I, you might have discussed in the, in the beginning, but I, and it was not found. So. How did Arjuna come to ask these questions? Well, he wants to understand more clearly. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, con, it's a def, something which has to be understood properly. We know Prabhupada spoke a lot about we're not this body. To understand we're not the body. Prabhupada spoke many times on this point, again and again. Very important because he wants to get it really into our heads. It's the foundational point of our Krishna conscious philosophy. And although we say, well, I know I'm not the body, but still we don't act on that platform. So Arjuna wants to hear, again, he wants this topic to be discussed more. And we explained the, the connection from the previous chapter that Krishna says he will deliver the living entities. So, how do we get delivered? We have to have that, this proper understanding. We have to be worthy of being delivered by Krishna. So Arjuna wants to, he wants it to be, he wants it to be very clear in his mind. Prakriti and Purush. The body and the knower of the body. Knowledge and the object of knowledge. Very important points. This, like I said, this is Sankhya, Sankhya philosophy. We want to understand the, the root of this uh, material nature, the root of our existence here in this world. Very important for us to understand clearly the nature, the, the difference between the super soul and the individual soul. mean to say that in the middle six chapters it was of talk was of going on the, uh, of pure devotion service so, uh, like uh, in the in the last verse the, uh, the 
Translation says those who follow this imperishable path of devotion to Sahaja, those who completely increase themselves with faith in me, in me, the Supreme Good, are very dear to me. So Krishna was explaining all those who are dear to me, and it appears that Arjuna suddenly got, uh, recalled something, or I mean, wanted to clarify something, and he jumped back to the Sankhya Yoga. I mean, he's, uh, Krishna is at the top, elevated from different yoga system, and it came to Bhakti Yoga, and Krishna explained about Bhakti Yoga completely. And suddenly, Arjun, uh, what... Uh, uh, well, remember, I, exp I explained how the, the, the first six chapters and the last six chapters are like coverings, you see? The, the center part was a valuable part, the part where Krishna is discussing Bhakti Yoga. But the, Krishna wants some covering over the Bhakti Yoga. Therefore, the first six chapters, the last six chapters, it comes in the middle. And this, 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 this is the covering again. We're, coming, we're getting the covering on the Bhakti Yoga. We have to protect the Bhakti Yoga. And it's protected by this covering. And we get this good covering and we get a proper understanding of the body and the nore of the body, the field of activity, the nore of the field. We understand these things properly, then we're more qualified for Bhakti Yoga. So it, it's not a waste of time, it's very carefully presented. The Bhagavad Gita, very systematic presentation. The covering of the bhakti, the bhakti is there in the middle, the valuable part is in the middle. And here we're looking at the covering again, the sankhya, the covering. Because we have to understand these things carefully, then we're more qualified, we're more able to devote ourselves fully to Lord Krishna and understand the value of his teachings. If we just simply take up bhakti yoga without understanding properly, it won't be so effective. We really want to understand, we want to have a good philosophical basis and this is being given here in these coverings. May I speak more, Maharaj? Okay. Okay. So, uh, is it like that that Arjuna has understood everything and he is also uh, intentionally, he is also wanting to give a covering to Bhakti in this, in this conversation between Krishna and Arjuna? Because Arjuna has, uh, it in, in the previous chapters also regarding Virat Rupa and all. So, Arjuna uh, was in the mood to. Uh, of compassion to the other living entities and therefore he asked certain questions for the future to establish the Krishna and Supreme Lord. And here, uh, like we have come to the topmost of Bhakti Yoga and Arjuna is going back to Sankhya Yoga. So is it also that Arjuna, uh, he has understood everything but simultaneously he also wished to give the topic that is why he's asking. So generally in a conversation, if I'm uh, in a conversation with any senior devotee or uh, my uh, Guru Maharaj, Generally, when things uh, go on from the base, like Karma Yoga, Sankhya Yoga, Karma and everything was explained, and then we kept, kept coming to Bhakti Yoga. And then, if I go again to uh, the, this previous explanation, either I have not understood it properly, uh, the, the only reason maybe that I have not understood it properly, then I will go back, or I just want to re clarify my understanding. So, I'm just trying to get inside the head of Arjuna. I'm not qualified for that, obviously, but just to understand it, what is Arjuna thinking of again going back? Well, remember, Arjuna is, you know, he's not an ordinary person. He's, he's always with Krishna, and he's heard the Bhagavad Gita. Man, where, wherever Krishna goes, Krishna is speaking the Bhagavad Gita with Arjuna. He, you know, they're Nara and Narayan. So they, he comes... They come together. Arjuna doesn't need this teaching, but he's taking this position to be the student of Krishna for the benefit of all of us. So in this position, Arjuna is on the battlefield at Kurukshetra and he's bewildered about the situation. He wants to understand everything very clearly. He's got to take part in this battle. Krishna, Krishna he can understand Krishna obvious, obviously wants him to go in the battle and to fight. But Arjuna wants to confirm everything, make sure he's got everything very clear. The first section was deal dealing more with karma, by activity that we come to devotion. Now we're going to learn by jnana, by knowledge, we will also come to devotion. So we, we will see that 
the connection there from the philosophy, how it brings us also to the path of devotion, the same thing. This is the point that we have to understand that it is really devotion which is the central theme. And don't be bewildered that there's something else being taught here. And it's not that he's going back. We're going to hear about Gyan. We're going to... There hasn't been a lot of emphasis on Gyan. We haven't heard much about the modes of nature. But we're going to hear about it now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Maharaj, we have one more question. Would you like to take now? All right. Apurva Nilachal Eshwari Hare Krishna Maharaj, I just wanted some clarification like uh, in Prakriti Purusha Shetra and Shetragya. So generally we say that Purusha is the Lord and Prakriti is the, all the uh, like living entity and the energies of the Lord. But uh, here the, uh, the Shetragya is the lower, mainly so here does the Purusha refer to the living entity? Yes, right, yeah. I take your point. Yeah, but the living entity is also a prakriti, you're saying. Yes, but living entity is superior prakriti. So in this particular case, the living entity is being described as the knower of the field, the shetra, the shetragna. It's the, but the purusha is the, uh, the lord himself. Yes, purusha is the supreme lord, right? We're trying, we're also trying to be Purusha. We always think of ourselves as Purusha, you know, we think we are the enjoyer, we have that tendency. But ultimately there's only one Purusha, Krishna, he's the real Purusha. We're just trying to, you know, we're trying to take his position. We're really not Purushas, but we're subordinate to him. And Prabhupada makes this point, just coming up here, at that going back there, uh, just over there in chapter and purport of text number three, it said there, said uh, that there are two knowers. One is fallible, the other is infallible. One is superior, other is subordinate. Right? We don't always like to be subordinate. That's the problem. We think we're the Purusha. One who understands the two is said to be actually the knower. All right, so this is the point. Thank you for bringing that up, Madhiji. I yes, said Krishna does describe the living entity as superior prakriti, but uh, here in this particular case, uh, uh, the example was given that the living entity is the knower in the field of activities, is Shetragna. Right? And so we have this example. Text number five, an important purport, and uh, we have the example, a quote from the, in the purport, we have the quote from the Taitareya Upanishad, Jiva Goswami, Prabhupada quotes Jiva Goswami, it's actually Jiva Goswami who brought this up, and taken from the Taitareya Upanishad, Brahma Pucham Pratishta. Right? Let's read this paragraph. Does it, can everyone find this? As stated before, Shetra is the field of activities. Yes. Someone like to read this for us, please? As stated before, Shetra is the field of activities and there are two kinds of Shetra. The individual living entity and the supreme living entity. As stated in the Taitrai Upanishad 2.9, Brahma Pucham Pratistha, there is a manifestation of the Supreme Lord's energy known as Annamaya, dependence upon food for existence. This is a materialistic realization of the Supreme. Then in Pranamaya, after realizing the Supreme Absolute Truth in food, one can realize the Absolute Truth in the living symptoms or life forms. In the Gnanamaya, a realization extends beyond the living symptoms to the point of thinking, feeling and willing. Then there is Brahman realization called Vijnanamaya, in which the living entity's mind and life symptoms are distinguished from the living entity himself. The next and supreme stage is Anandamaya, realization of the all-blissful nature. 
Thus, there are five stages of Brahma realization, which are called Brahma Pucham. Maharaj, do you want me to continue, Maharaj? Uh, okay, let's discuss what you've read so far here. So five stages of Brahman realization, right? We were talking about the Brahman. We were describing, Prabhu was, uh, Madhaji was, or we were talking how the material nature is also the Brahman. So here we have a, an, an interesting point which is brought up, that there are five different stages of Brahman realization. And they're described here, progressively. Uh, Ana Maya. Ana, of course, meaning grain. And so, just like the young child, when the child is born, the child doesn't know anything else except food. You know, they open their eyes, they want food, and other times they go to sleep. And so that's like Ana Maya, just simply depending on food. If somebody's only thinking about, the, if their only goal in life is to fill the belly, then this is the lowest level of consciousness. And this is anamaya, simply depending on food. No other purpose but to fill the belly. So above that is the pranamaya. Prana meaning, of course, the, the life symptoms. So one is more aware of life. We are becoming, we are not just thinking only of food, but we can actually understand that there's living symptoms. You can understand the difference between someone, someone who's living and something which is just simply dead matter. So this is pranamaya, recognizing the symptoms of life within a person, within the body of a living entity. And then above that comes jnana maya. And Jnana Maya is talking about the different life living symptoms as they are described. Thinking, feeling, willing, right? These are the activities of the mind. So this kind of realization, we start to become more aware, we start to think, we have desires, we have feelings, and we want things very bad. So these, these are all different stages of Brahman realization. And then there is Brahman realization called Vigyana Maya, in which the living entity's mind and life symptoms are distinguished from the living entity himself. So, Vigyana Maya, one has actually become aware that I'm not the body and I'm not the mind, I'm not these thoughts. I'm different from these things. One actually has become aware of his individual identity. It's a vigyana maya, some realization of our spiritual nature. And then the final stage is ananda maya, realization of the all blissful nature, that we are spirit souls and we are eternally a part of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So this is the desired stage of perfection, to understand our spiritual nature as part and parcel of Lord Krishna and to be engaged in his service and one should feel, one will feel naturally that bliss. So we'll go ahead, read the next section. Out of these, the first three, Anamaya, Pranamaya and Gnanamaya, involve the fields of activities of the living entities. Transcendental to all these fields of activities is the Supreme Lord, who is called Anandamaya. The Vedanta Sutra also describes the Supreme by saying, Anandamayo Abhyasa. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is by nature full of joy. To enjoy his transcendental bliss, he expands into Vijnanamaya, Pranamaya, Gnanamaya and Anamaya. In the field of activities, the living entity is considered to be the enjoy and different from him is the Anandamaya. That means that if the living entity decides to enjoy in dovetailing himself with the Anandamaya, then he becomes perfect. This is the real picture of the Supreme Lord as the Supreme Knower of the field. The living entity as the subordinate knower and the nature of the field of activities. activities. One has to search for this truth in the Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
So Srila Prabhupada is describing for us this nature of this Brahman realization that he quotes Anandamaya Bhaisat, Anandamaya Bhaisat, the Supreme Lord, by nature he is always blissful, full of joy. And we are also meant to be blissful, we are also meant to be Ananda. When we are connected to him, we have that. But then Prabhupada explains, to enjoy his bliss, he expands, and he expands into these different levels of realization. First there is the Vigyana Maya, right? The realization of ourself just simply as a spirit soul, without having realization of our connection with the Supreme. And then below that, then you have the three realizations of Brahman, which involve the field of activities, involve the body, pranamaya, jnanamaya, anamaya. This is related to the, the body, the living entity's material body. So, these five different levels of realization, they're given here in this purport. We want to understand the significance of these five different levels of Brahman, the, how they relate, three relate to the material body and other two relate to our spiritual nature, to the knower of the body, knower of the field. It is mentioned here that the codes of the Brahma Sutra, going on, the codes of the Brahma Sutra are very nicely arranged according to cause and effect. Some of the sutra are, or aphorisms are Naviyad Ashrute, Natma Shrute, and Paratu Tachrute. The first aphorism indicates the field of activities, the second indicates the living entity, and the third indicates the Supreme Lord, the Saman Bonum among all the manifestations of various entities. All right, so in this way, Srila Prabhupada tells us from the Vedanta Sutra, the same knowledge is being presented. And Prabhupada quotes these three different aphorisms from the Brahma Sutras, from Vedanta Sutra. They're talking about the field of activities, the Lord and the living entity. So this same knowledge is being presented for us here. Lord Krishna is saying, we have to understand everything based on sadhu, shastra and guru. Then he says, Vedanta Sutra is presented according to all reason, stated with all reasoning as to cause and effect. So, <laughs> cause and effect, right? The cause of everything, the effect of it, it's all there in the Brahma Sutra. And Prabhupada quotes Brahma Sutra to support this. So we're learning the same thing. So it's a complex subject matter. We have to read this. We have to hear this. We have to understand different conceptions of the Brahman. You should know the five different realizations of the Brahman. We should un understand a little bit of this knowledge and gradually Krishna reveals more to us. Certainly we can understand the, the lowest state, Anamaya, simply based on food and then becoming a little more conscious, we're aware of life symptoms, the Pranamaya and then above that Jnana Maya or Mana Maya, where we have desires. So this is the three stages of Brahman relating to the field of activities, to the body. And then on the higher platform, we have Vigyana Maya and Ananda Maya. All right? Can we go ahead or are there any more, any questions? Yes, okay, let's take the questions. Hindu Lekha Kripa Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. 
Uh, my question is, Maharaj, this, uh, the lower stage, it is like the realization we have to know, or it is already known, the people like uh, who are ignorant and they are in the stage of Annamaya, like that, or we have to understand Brahman in that way, the step-by-step -step way, or it is like people are in these stages. How is it, Maharaj? We have to know these stages. Okay. We have to know. It is not that people are in this stage of uh, like uh, understanding. Like some are there in the stage of Annamaya, some are uh, in the stage well, of Well, definitely some are. Definitely people are in this stage. But we have to know these stages also. We have to be aware that these stages are there. As devotees, we want to be aware that these different stages are there. The different tendencies are there within the living entities. Okay. Uh, Smriti Karuna Man. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I am literally not able to understand when it is said to enjoy his transcendental bliss, he expands into Vigyan Maya, Pran Maya, Gyan Maya, and Maya. Why, when he is already in, uh, on the ultimate platform, then why does he need to, you know, expand into all the lower forms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why does he need to expand himself for the pleasure to give mercy to all these other living entities, to give them also an opportunity that they can also engage in some kind of activity? That is his the Lord's compassion, the Lord's kindness, and He's giving them also the chance, the opportunity that they can come, they can know Him. And gradually they can come to understand Him. So they have to begin somewhere, though they begin by eating. We see life symptoms like that, the beginning of life. Living entities, you know, so many birds and insects, and they're simply thinking, where is food? Where is food? So that's the lowest level of consciousness. The point is there are different levels of consciousness. The Lord has expanded Himself into these different levels of consciousness to facilitate the desires of the individual living entities. Because living entities desire like this. Have one more question. Uh, Sachin Anand Prabhu. Uh, when it is partly answered, it is almost answered, but uh, just to understand it better, Maharaj, uh, here uh, regarding the different kinds of uh, realizations, we are trying to understand the Shet Pragya or the Supreme Lord and how he is manifested in the how he can be understood by his energies, as it is mentioned. It is the manifestation of the Supreme Lord energy as Anuman. So we are talking about the energies of the Supreme Lord, how they are, uh, how they can be understood by uh, in uh, energies of the Supreme Lord in relation to the Kshetra, in relation to the field, and how they can be moved. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. We want to understand the Supreme Lord and how he relates with the living entities and how the living entities are existing in this material world, enjoying the field of activities. What is the field of activities? What is the knowledge they have? What is real knowledge? What is the object of knowledge? So this will all be explained. And uh, these different uh, uh, kind of realizations, Anamaya, Gyanamaya, they are actually the, uh, the energies of the Lord. Well, everything is the energy of the Lord. The Lord has, has so many energies, right? We say the, there's the Bahiranga Shakti, the Antaranga Shakti, the Tatasta Shakti, they're the principal energies. And so, yes, everything is ultimately the energy of the Lord. Uh, Shankaracharya, he quotes the Sarvam Kalvidam Brahman, that everything is Brahman. 
And so everything is the Lord's energy, but it's, it's, but it's different from the Lord, right? There's the, there's the energetic and the energy. We are also the energy of the Lord. We are also Prakriti. We are also His energy. Right? Yeah. But here we are trying to understand the Lord by His energies. I mean, uh, one is on the level of unknown my consciousness. He tries to understand the Lord by, uh, by the food which He gets that He eats. Yes, uh, right. The energy of the Lord. He yes. There is someone superior who is supplying me the, the food. Yes. In that way, and then yes. in Jnana, my understanding, there is uh, different kind of understanding. And then Ananda, my there is uh, 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 the Supreme Lord is completely uh, blissful, and I'm I'm being a part of it. Is I'm also blissful. So this is how one relates to the Supreme Lord. By this All right. Yes. Good. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Can we go on? Uh, we have one more question. Would you like to take? Yes. Chaitanya Prasad Pu. Yes. We're talking about the Lord's energy. The Brahman. Yeah, there are many manifestations of the Brahman. It appears in many different forms. Right? We have the, the you have the Brahma Jyoti, the effulgence coming from the body of the Lord, this Brahman. But we have also the living entities, the spark of the the living in, individual living entity. Atma, the Jivatma, we are also Brahman. And we have the material nature. The material nature we were explaining can also be understood as Brahman. Support. Although it doesn't have consciousness, but it's still the Prakriti of the Lord. But here, this verse specifically is speaking of both mother. I'm confused about. Huh? This verse. Can you speak up? This verse, I speaking about what? About this, the energy of Lord? Verse number 5? Yeah, Maharaj. This Brahman, here it's mentioned those are the five states of Brahman, realization. Uh, yes. Is it talking about the uh, Sorry, the voice is breaking. I couldn't hear. Talking about five what? Five stages of Brahman realization here. Is it talking about the energy of Lord? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Energy of the Lord. Brahman. It's the energy of the Lord. Sorry, I was kicked up due to my bad network. Sorry, ma'am. No, okay. But, uh, yes, there's the Lord and the Lord's energy. There's the energy, energetic and the energy. So we are all the Lord's energy. And the material manifestation is also the Lord's energy. And there are different uh, consciousness, different stages of consciousness within each and every living entity. So these different consciousnesses are being described here, different stages of consciousness of the Brahman, of our nature, beginning with the Anamaya, right, from the beginning of life, some materialistic societies, they simply work, they simply base everything on filling the belly. And if they fill the belly, they're satisfied. They think their life is successful. So that's Anamaya. And Gyanamaya, a little bit more, oh, no, Pranamaya comes next. Pranamaya. Oh, Pranamaya. 
we, we recognize, oh, my countryman or my fellow member, fam family, fa family member, and we relate to people close to us, and we think my friend, and this person's my enemy. So like that, life symptoms. And above that, jnana maya, having desires, want to satisfy the senses, these things. So this is all different levels of consciousness of the living entity, how we live in this world, how we're affected. All right, we'll go ahead. We want to look at, just try to finish this first section, up to text number seven. It's the first section. Can we just... Quickly read it through. Let's read the Sanskrit. Mahabhutani ahankaro buddhiravyaktamevacha indriyani daisaikam cha pancha chandriya gochara itcha dvesha sukham dukham sangatas chetanadriti etat chitram samasena savikaram udaritam. The five great elements, false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, the ten senses in the mind and the five sense objects, desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms and conviction, all these are considered in summary to be the field of activities and its interactions. So Lord Krishna is describing, what's he describing here? Thank you, Shetra, right, the field of activities, the Shetra. You want to know what is the field of activities? It's all mentioned here, the different elements of the field, right? So Prabhupada, the five great elements, meaning, five great elements are? Earth, water. Right, the fire, earth, water, fire, air, ether, these five great elements, Mahabhuti, and then the false ego, intelligence, the unmanifested, there's that's one, two, three more. Then the ten senses. Why ten senses? And one more, the mind, meaning eleven senses. So, ten senses means five... five. Yes, five knowledge acquiring senses. And five karmendriyas, five working senses, right? We should know those. The ten, not, what are the five knowledge senses? We get knowledge from the eyes, the nose, the tongue, the ear, and the skin. And then the working senses? Legs, uh, hands. Yes. Um, speech. Speech. And then we have also an evacuating organ and a procreating organ. So those are the five working senses. Right? Five working senses, the voice, legs, hands, anus and genitals. Anus, the evacuating organ, the genitals, the procreating organ. So like that, five working senses along with the mind. So, to, and then the five sense objects. Sense objects being? I smell, taste, yes. taste. Right. Okay, you've got the five sense objects. And then we hear about the interactions of the field of activity. Desire, hatred, happiness, distress, the aggregate, the life symptoms and convictions. So these are the aggregate, this is the the interactions of the field of activity, right? So, 
we should know these things. Prabhupada writes, Now the aggregate of these twenty-four elements is called the field of activity. If one makes an analytical study of these twenty-four subjects, then he can very well understand the field of activity. Then there are desire, hatred, happiness and distress, which are interactions, representations of the five great elements in the gross body. The living symptoms, represented by consciousness and convictions, are the manifestation of the subtle body, mind, ego and intelligence. These subtle elements are included within the field of activity. Right? So the subtle elements are also included there, the mind, the ego, intelligence. Because of them, that's why we have these different living symptoms. Mm. I'll just read a little more here. The five great elements are a gross representation of the false ego, which in turn represents the primal stage of false ego, technically called the material conception, materialistic conception, or tamasi buddhi, intelligence in ignorance. This is, this is an, an interesting point. If you read Srimad Bhagavatam in the third canto, teachings of Lord Kapila, we learn there that the false ego in ignorance interacts to produce the intelligence. And false ego in the mode of passion produces the mind. Oh no, false ego in the mode of goodness produces the mind. And false ego in the mode of ignorance produces the uh, intelligence. Tamasi buddhi, intelligence in ignorance, right? This, so, Prabhu, this is being explained here, Prabhupada is mentioning this, the materialistic conception, tamasi buddhi, intelligence in ignorance. It comes from the false ego. This is all described in the third canto of Lord Kapila's teachings. The false ego in goodness, and in passion and in ignorance. So the intelligence comes out of false ego in ignorance and the mind comes out of false ego in passion. I think I've got it, I have to, <laughs> I'm a bit confused myself now, I have to check it over. But it's there in the third canto, chapter 26 of the third, chap the third canto, Lord Kapila's teaching Sankhya Yoga. And you'll see he talks about how the mind and the intelligence and the, and the senses, they all come out of different interactions of different states of false ego. So this is the unmanifested stage of the three modes of material nature. The unmanifested modes of material nature are called Pradhan. Right? When material nature is unmanifested, it's pradhan. When it's manifested, then it's, then it's uh, not pradhan, then it becomes, then it becomes material nature, the different elements. So you want to know about these 24 elements? You can read chapter 26 of the third canto of Lord Kapila and they're described in detail there. The body is the representation of all these factors and there are changes of the body which are six in number. The body is born, grows, stays, produces byproducts, begins to decay. And at the last stage, it vanishes. So six transformations of the body, six changes, which all of our bodies, every living entity goes through. The trees go through these changes, 
the insects go through these changes, the flowers go through these changes, and we also go through these changes. Therefore, the field is a non-permanent material thing. However, the Shetrakna, the knower of the field, its proprietor is different. All right? Do we have any questions? Is everyone okay with, yes? The body, description of the body, the field of activities has been given to us, 24 elements. And the six changes which the body goes through. No questions. Oh, really? Okay. Okay, now we have one question. Uh, Kripa Krishna Maharaj, can you just again explain a little bit about the second paragraph? The five great elements are the gross representation of Paul's ego. So I, am, I was not very clear about it, but I didn't understand it. Where is it? For second paragraph, Maharaj. Second. The five great elements are the gross representation of the false ego. Yes. Okay. Because we said that these different elements, they come out from the false ego. Just like we said, the intelligence and the mind also comes out from different stages of false ego. So the five great elements, they're a gross representation of the false ego. Right? They come... The, the, the elements are created from subtle to gross. The finest element is ether. Ether is the first element. And within ether, there is the quality of sound. There's no other quality. There's no taste. There's no touch. There's no sight. There's no smell. But within ether, there is sound. So ether is the first element to be created and it's coming from the gross, from the false ego. The false ego transforms to produce the first element of the material nature, which is ether. And then from the ether, after ether, the second element will be what? Do you know? Sky. Um, sky. Yes. And what qualities are in the sky? Sky is having uh, form. Mm, does it? No. Uh, it's having. Well, it has the quality of ether, which was sound. Sound. Yes. And one more yes. is touch. Oh, yeah, touch. Because you, you said sky, I would say air. You know, mm, when touch. the air blows, when the wind blows, you can feel the touch, touch. of, right? Touch. Yes. So touch is there. Right? And then after air, next one is? Fire. Fire. And fire has? Sound and touch and form. Yes. Fire has a form. Can be a big blazing fire, maybe a little fire, a little light, like a candle light. So it has form. And then after fire, next one is? And water has sound taste. And, taste. and taste, right, as well as taste, as well as sound, touch, and form has also taste. taste. And the final element? Earth. Earth. earth and earth has? Smell. smell. Taste, right. And smell. Mm. Is it? This conception of So in this way, the, the elements are created from the false ego, right? It's not that everything just comes about by chance, but it's a very systematic 
scientific development of the different elements with more different qualities manifesting within each element. Right? Arishna Maharaj, why is it in the uh, intelligence in the mode of ignorance? Yes, I was explaining about that from Kapila, Lord Kapila Sankhya Yoga, mm. that the intelligence comes from from the, ignorance, from yes. ignorance right. Yes. Why? Because, because with intelligence we do things like planning. We, you, you know, we plan and that, that's considered, to, in, according to Ayurveda, this tendency towards planning, this is more symptom with the mode of ignorance. The mind is more passionate, the mind will just do things without thinking, without planning. So this is more passion, but the intelligence is ignorance because we're planning, we make plans, you know, and this is a pro this is a problem. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. We have one more question. Uh, Smriti Karuna Matani. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, when it is said the unmanifested modes of material nature are called Pradhan, so does it mean when it says unmanifested that it is not yet Mahatattva? Does it mean that? Yes. It is not. Right, that's the point. When it becomes manifest, then it's a Mahatattva. But the unmanifested stage is called Pradhan. Right? The unmanifested Pradhan and manifest stage is Mahatattva. And from the Mahatattva, then the different elements come up. Yes. When you study the second canto, you'll see second canto, third canto, so many different creations are given there. And you'll hear many times about the creation of the different elements, how they come and everything's coming from the Pradhan to the Mahatattva, then from the Mahatattva then we get the false ego with the touch of the false ego and then the different elements come out. Yes. yes so this is the primary creation. Brahma does the secondary creation. Oh. All right, any other questions? No All right, so we'll stop here today and we'll go on tomorrow. We want to please look over the text. Uh, we'll look at these uh, different items, uh, the ob object of knowledge, uh, the process of knowledge rather. Process of knowledge is there, verses 8 to 12. These 20 different items, important to look over them, be familiar with this. And we'll discuss them tomorrow. And probably we'll spend the whole day on the thirteenth chapter and probably maybe even part of the third day. We'll try to finish it as quick as possible. Okay, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna.